Open up our heart, Lord, to things unseen. I'd uh, posted something on Twitter yesterday as an article that I read about how we should read God's Word and how we should read it fresh every time. I'm sure we've, uh, many of us in this room, can't say all, but I'm sure many of us in this room have read 1 John uh, quite a lot, several times. Uh, that's our text this morning, 1 John chapter 1. And I'm going to be uh, expounding these verses uh, verse by verse here in just a few minutes. Um, leading up to um, expounding these verses, I want us to consider uh, some of these questions. So we're talking about salvation. Is your salvation based on some type of religious experience? Think about that question. I'm not looking for a response. Is your salvation based on a religious experience or is your salvation based on a life lived in repentance? And which evidence is more valid? A past experience? Or a life lived in faith and repentance. Everybody understand the question? Is there or are there tests that we can use to determine whether or not we have genuinely been saved? That's why we're looking at 1 John. Is there anything more important than salvation? What does it mean to be saved? Are you saved? And if so, what are you saved from? What are you saved for? Can a person really know if he or she has been saved? I hear people occasionally respond to the question which I try to refrain from asking are you saved and oftentimes the response is well can a person really know a few years ago I had an uncle who was dying with cancer when I got word that he was in the hospital and that he was about to have surgery and that chances were slim that he would make it through the surgery, I went to see him. When I walked into his hospital room, there was uh, several people there, but it didn't matter. I went there to talk to him about his salvation, and it didn't take long after entering the room that I questioned him about his salvation. There was no point in waiting for an opportune time. Doug was dying. In fact, each day he was marking a calendar indicating that he had one less day to live. And in questioning him about his salvation, his relationship with God, his answer was, quote, I don't know, unquote. I don't know. Wouldn't you hate to get to the end of your life and not know where you will spend eternity? One of the major doctrines we find in John's first letter is the doctrine of salvation and the assurance of it. One of the key verses that we find in 1 John is chapter 5 and verse 13. And by the way, we believe in scripture memorization. And this is one of those verses that you need to have memorized. Just like we've all memorized John 3.16. <laughs> What's your favorite Bible verse? John 3.16. <laughs> right? This is one of those verses we need to have memorized. These things I have written to you. John says, I'm writing this letter to you, the reader. I'm writing this letter to you so that 
you may know that you have eternal life. In fact, he says, I have written to you who believe in the name of Son of God that you may know. Everybody say no. No. That you may know that you have eternal life. He said, this this is, this is, and and he gives several purpose statements, and we're going to look at two of them this morning, three counting this one. But, but, a, but a major purpose for John writing this letter is so that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue, that's perseverance, that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So how can we know? And in this letter, John attempts to answer that question How we can know that we have eternal life. How we can know that we have a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. So over the next several weeks, we're going to be digging into 1 John. We'll be talking about how we can know for sure that we're going to heaven when we die. How we can know for sure that we have been forgiven and that we have a relationship with God. And that we have a place reserved for us in heaven. Having a conversation with somebody this week, and uh, so many times, everybody listening, I, I, I want to correct some people's theology. We're all guilty of doing this. I am as well. But, but we need to be careful when we talk about heaven and refer to it as our reward. Heaven is not our reward. A, a reward is something you earn. None of us in here has earned heaven. What we have earned is hell. The wages of sin is death. So be careful referring to heaven as your reward. It ain't your reward. It's your inheritance as a child of God. And there's a huge difference. (laughs) I firmly believe that there are people and, 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 the, and, and, and the reason I believe this, and I'm going to give you a verse, and, and Caleb, we got Matthew 7. Did, I, did you get that one plugged in? Go ahead and pull that up. The, the reason I, I say I, I believe, I, I firmly believe that there are people, and the reason I believe it is based on this verse. It's not just something that I've made up in my mind, but I, but I firmly believe that there are people, in fact, the Scripture says there are many people who are deceived About their salvation. Jesus put it like this in Matthew chapter 7 and and, in verse 21 and following. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Everybody that says they're a Christian is not a Christian. To paraphrase what Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But but notice the next phrase. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What you say with your mouth needs to be backed up with your life. Now, Now understand what Jesus is saying in Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, Not not everyone who says Jesus Christ is my Savior shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven, those those who do the will of God will enter the kingdom of heaven. So, So are you living in God's will? Are you doing God's will? He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven, in the text, many will say to me in that day, many as opposed to few, many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many wonders in your name? And Jesus says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It was Billy Graham. You've heard of Billy Graham, right? It was Billy Graham who said the greatest evangelistic field that we have as Christians is people sitting in our pews on Sunday morning. 
We can be deceived into thinking we're saved when in reality we're not. When I make a statement like that, it upsets someone. You're the very person I'm talking to. How dare you bring into question my salvation? I've had people get upset when you ask them about their salvation. How dare you question my salvation? <laughs> well, the Bible says we are to question it. First Peter, or Second Peter, chapter 1, I should say, verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. Paraphrase, be diligent to make sure of your salvation. For if you do these things, Peter says, you will never fall. And you'll receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Paul put it like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5. He says, examine yourself. Test yourselves as to whether or not you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ in you is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? Peter says, make sure of your call and election. We've been talking about calling on Wednesday nights in our study of the doctrine of salvation. What does it mean to be called? Who is called? Make sure of your calling and election. That's salvation. Examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? So the Bible tells us that we are to, that we're to test, that, that we're to test ourselves, that we're to examine ourselves to determine whether or not we are truly saved, to determine whether or not we have truly been born again. Most scholars believe that John is writing to Christians who live in Ephesus. Again, the text this morning is 1 John chapter 1. He's writing to various churches. This letter is five chapters long, right? And so back in the day when John penned these words, this was, this was what they call a circulating letter, and it would go to all the churches in Asia Minor. They didn't have, a, they didn't have mass copies of the Word of God back then. And so there was a circulating letter, and it would go from one church to the other church. And they would read this letter in the various churches that, that, that received it. And one of the reasons he writes this letter is to refute, or one of the reasons that he writes this letter is to disprove those who were opposed to the churches. There were people in those churches, and, and we base this on our study of First John, there, there were people in those churches that denied that Jesus was the Christ. They denied that Jesus was divine, that he was fully God, that he was fully human. They denied that they themselves were sinners, that, that they were dominated by sin or that they were su su subject to sin. The opposition, according to many scholars, is that it was an early form of Gnosticism, which John was writing to refute, which is a complicated form of religion that resembles what we might call today New Age thinking. It was dualistic. It was philosophical. The term Gnosticism is derived from the Greek word gnosis, knowledge, because secret knowledge was such a crucial doctrine in Gnosticism, they valued knowledge over faith. And there were those who claimed that because they were Christians, y'all listening, say, mm -hmm. there were those in the churches who claimed that because they were Christians, they were not responsible for how they lived their life and they could act any old way they please without fear of being eternally judged. And so their salvation was just a ticket. It was, it was a life insurance policy. You got your life insurance policy, you can go live how you want to live, but when you die, thank God you're going to heaven. That's the idea. It was a false belief in salvation. They were deceived into thinking they were saved when in reality... They were lost. And so that's the context in which John wrote this letter. And so I raised the question, can that happen to people today? Can people be deceived into thinking they are saved when in reality they are lost? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And so I asked that question, can people be deceived into thinking they're saved when in reality they're lost? And if so, what are the consequences? They're fatal. And the consequences are eternal. And so John writes this letter to bolster. He writes this letter to reinforce, to encourage confidence. Listen to me. He writes this letter to encourage confidence in the true believer and to give assurance of salvation and to overcome the doubt of some who may have been questioning their salvation. You see, my goal in this study is not to make you doubt your salvation, but my goal in this study is to help make you sure of it based on the authoritative word of God, not your opinion. Not your opinion. So I'm finding out that so many people's salvation is based on what they think. <laughs> Gnosis, Gnosticism, having a conversation with Someone this week about salvation had an opportunity to share the gospel. The question comes up, do you know for certain that you would go to heaven when you die? And the answer is yes. My question is, what do you base that on? I, I, I know that I'm going to heaven when I die. Well, well what do you base that on? Well, I, I just know. Well, what do you base that knowledge on? Well, I just feel like I, I, I believe in God. I, 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 I've talked to God and, 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 and based on a, a, this experience, and, and, and they start talking about this experience that they had a long time ago. So, so that's the basis of your salvation. Jesus Christ hasn't been mentioned. But the basis of their salvation is based on what they think, what they think they know. It's based on some kind of experience they had. But Jesus Christ is never mentioned. Seriously. It's not uncommon. Ask people. See, our, our salvation is not based on what we think. Our salvation is not based on our opinion. Our, our salvation is based on what the Word of God teaches us. And Paul says this in 2 Timothy 2.15. He says that it's the Holy Scriptures <laughs> that make us wise for salvation. So the, the question is, what is the, when, it, when it comes to the assurance of our salvation, what does the book say? Not... What kind of experience have I had or what do I think or this is my opinion? What does the authoritative word of God say? In this letter, 1 John, it helps us as the reader of this word, it helps us understand what it truly means to be saved, what it truly means to have saving faith. And there are many tests, and we're going to be looking at several of them over the next few weeks. There are many tests that John gives us, the reader, to help us determine whether or not we are genuinely saved. And so John begins this letter, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. I, I, I'm about to go verse by verse, okay? This is called expositional preaching. We're going verse by verse. We're going to take each verse one at a time. We're going down through chapter 2, verse 1. So John begins this letter, verse 1. Unlike, uh, unlike most of the other letters in the New Testament, there's no greeting. The author in, of this letter never identifies himself. It's believed, it's been believed for a long time that John is the author of this letter. And so he starts out by making the point that Jesus is the Christ. And it's almost as if he is defending Christ, that he was who he said he was. And John, John knows that Jesus was who he said he was because John himself was an eyewitness. Look at what he says, 1 John chapter verse, verse 1. I'm, I'm sorry, what, what did I just say? 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. Did I get it right that time? Thank you, teleprompter. Quit laughing. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, I love this language, which we have heard. That which was from the beginning, which we have seen with our own eyes. That which was from the beginning, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Y'all don't hear what he's doing? He's giving testimony, y'all. 
He's giving testimony of what he has seen and what he has heard. He's giving testimony of what he has touched. He's been with Jesus. He he begins his gospel, the gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John, so John is is writing here. He's writing about the Lord Jesus Christ. And John says, I'm an eyewitness concerning the life of Christ. I've seen his miracles. I've heard him speak. I saw him open the eyes of the blind. The testimony is true about him because I was there. I was there. I saw it. I was with him. Verse 2, the life was manifested. The life was shown to us. The life of Christ was revealed to us. We have seen and we bear witness and we declare to you. We give a special report. We proclaim. We make openly, we, we make known openly to you that eternal life which was with the Father and it was manifested. It was revealed to us. And John says that Jesus Christ is the one who is eternal life. He says Jesus Christ is the source of eternal life. Look at verse 3. That which we have seen and that which we have heard, we declare to you. You know what it, you know what it means to declare something? It means to proclaim openly. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim openly to you. Why? Why does John proclaim openly about that which he has seen and heard? Why does he want people to hear the message about Jesus Christ? It's in the text. Look at verse 3. John says, we declare to you that Jesus is the Christ so that you also... Now, notice what he says in verse 3. Pay attention, y'all. Notice what he says. He says, we declare open to you, openly to you that Jesus is the Christ for what purpose? It's in the text. So that we may have... So that you may have fellowship with us. John says, we want you to know that Jesus is the Christ so that you can have fellowship with us. This is important, y'all. We want you to know that Jesus is the Christ so that you can have fellowship with us. And notice what he says. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. (laughs) Help me out here, Cole. You're smart. I, 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 I have forgotten how to do algebra, right? But there's something like says... If, if A plus B equals C, and, and B plus C equals A, am I, okay, then A plus C equals B. That's probably some kind of, uh, it's a certain property. Thank you very much. You have helped me tremendously. I'm not sure I could repeat it, but y'all heard it. Right? If A plus B equals C and C plus B equals A, then A plus C equals B. Seriously. Say that again. That that sounded really intelligent. Say it again. It's called syllogism. It's called syllogism, y'all. Huh? Rick says a smart man gets the calculator. <laughs> it's hard to believe that Rick has children as intelligent as Mabry and Cole. Now, Carolyn, on the other hand, Carolyn's pretty smart too. <laughs> but you have to question her smartness also. She married Rick. <laughs> Well, that's on me, isn't it? <laughs> Look, that's, that's, that synergism that we just talked about. They didn't even pick up on that, so. <clears throat> the same principle that I was just, that we laughed about is applicable in this text. Notice what he says, that which we have seen and heard, verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. What had he seen and heard? Jesus. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. Why? So that, look at what he said, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Do you know what John is saying? If you have fellowship, if you have fellowship with us, 
then you have fellowship with Jesus Christ. I don't know if this is the right way to use what I'm talking about, but if you have fellowship with God, then you have fellowship with us. It's in the text. So to, to, the, the point is this, to have fellowship with true believers is to have fellowship with God. I'm going somewhere with this. Let me say that again. To have, true, to have fellowship with true believers, to have fellowship with, with Christians, to have fellowship with disciples of Christ is to have fellowship with God. So what does it mean if you don't have fellowship with other believers? <laughs> huh? So c- could it mean that you don't have fellowship with God? You don't have fellowship with other believers. Can, can, a person, can, a, can a person be in fellowship with God and out of fellowship with the body of Christ? We sure do have a lot of empty seats in here this morning. There sure is a lot of people on the church row. Sure has a lot of people pass through the baptismal waters. And where are they on Sunday morning? They ain't fellowshipping with the body. But I love God, but you don't love his body? You don't love the bride of Christ? You can say one thing, your actions prove otherwise. Are you saying you have to go to church to be a Christian? No, what I'm saying is found in 1 John chapter 3, verse 3. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So if you have fellowship with God, you have fellowship with the body of Christ. If you have fellowship with the body of Christ, you have fellowship with God. It's in the text. It's in the text. The term term fellowship, we're familiar with that uh, that word, right? It's the Greek word koinonia. It means oneness. It means association. It means community. So if a person is out of fellowship with his fellow believers, it is certain that he or she is out of fellowship with God. I'm talking to the choir this morning. I know that I am. So how can a person say they have fellowship with God when they have no fellowship with other believers? Is it really possible to be saved and not be in fellowship with other believers? How can a person say they are a follower of Christ? How can a person say they are a born-again child of God when they have no fellowship with other Christians? Look again at verse 3. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And so John is saying, if you have fellowship with us, then you have fellowship with God the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. Verse 4. And these things we write to you so that your joy may be full. Here's another purpose statement for which John wrote this letter. Y'all understand when y'all read a book, like in the preface or in the introduction, usually you will find the purpose statement of that book. And it's always good to know the purpose of the author when you read a book. It will help you understand the context in reading that book. Is this making sense to everybody? I know all of y'all are avid readers (laughs) of the Bible. Even more laughs. (laughs) And so it's important that we understand the purpose of whatever it is we're reading, right? To understand its context. And so this is one of the purpose statements that John gives, verse 4. These things we write to you, what? So that you, so that your joy may be full. So what does it mean to be full of joy? John says the reason we write this is so that you, the reader, may have complete joy. So that you may be glad. So that you may have delight. So that you may be happy. And the joy of which John speaks is a state of well-being that results from knowing and serving God. Or in this case, it is the state of well-being that comes from being in a right relationship with or a right fellowship with other believers and with God the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And so John says, I write this letter so that your joy, Christian reader, I write this letter so that your joy may be full. And I read that, and I have to ask the question, would you say that most people are really happy in life? Would you say that most people really know joy? And yet John wrote this letter so that we can experience joy. It seems most people's lives, it seems that in most people's lives something is missing. People are searching for something. They may not even be sure what it is. There's a void in each of our lives. They can only find peace through a right relationship with God, which comes through faith in Jesus Christ. John says, I wrote this letter so that you might have joy. 
It's just a thought. You want to know how to joy? You want you, you want to know how to have joy? Go buy a book by uh, what's his name? Osteen. Joel. Joel. Go buy a book by Joel Osteen. No, you want to know how to have joy? Read the Word of God and start in First John. John says, "I wrote this to you so that you might have joy." It's in the text. Then he says, verse 5, this is the message which we have heard from him. This is the message which we have heard from Christ. John says, I'm just an eyewitness. It's like like John said, I'm just telling you what what I've heard. And I heard it from Jesus, by the way. This is the message which we heard from him, that we heard from Christ. We declare to you that God is light. Look out now. He says, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. How are we to understand light and darkness in this context? And what John is doing is he's drawing on Old Testament imagery as he describes God as light. And we know that light in Scripture, it represents that which is good. Light in Scripture represents that which is moral. It represents that which is pure. It represents that which is righteous. It represents that which is true. And it represents that which is just. And when John says that God is light, he's saying that God is good, God is moral, God is pure, God is righteous, God is true, God is just. And so if light represents all that is good, then darkness must represent all that's bad. It represents that which is evil, it represents that which is sinful, it represents that which is immoral, impure, unrighteous. It represents things like lies and deceit. And so he says, God is light, God is good, God is moral, God is pure, God is just, God is righteous, God is holy, God is omnipotent, God is omniscient. And in him there's light and there's no darkness at all. There's no immorality, there's no impurity, there's no unrighteousness, there's no lying, there's no deceit. And so John authenticates his message by claiming that he heard it from Jesus Christ himself, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him, if we say that we have communion with God, if we say that we have oneness with God, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk, that's a metaphor for live, If we say that we have fellowship with God and live in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we say that we have fellowship with God who is light, he's holy, he's righteous, he's pure, he's just, and yet we live a life that's bad, that's evil, that's full of sin, that's full of immorality and impurity and unrighteousness, full of lies and deceit, We lie and do not practice the truth. Y'all listening, say amen. Amen. So John, to to paraphrase what what he's saying, we're not living in the truth if we live in spiritual darkness. If, if, if basically what he's saying, if, if we live in habitual sin, if we continually sin, and and it's just, it's, it's habitual, it's a, It's a habit. We're not living in the truth if we live in spiritual darkness but claim we have fellowship with God. You're a liar. I didn't say it. God's word did. You're a liar. And it would seem obvious from John's letter that John has a particular audience in mind that claim to know God. He has a particular audience in mind that claim to know God. He had a particular audience in mind that claimed to know God. He had a particular audience in mind that claimed to know God, but their life suggested otherwise. Y'all know anybody like that? Well, I do. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, That is, if we live in the light of God's presence, just as Christ is, we have fellowship, we have communion, we have oneness with one another. I love this line, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So what's John doing here? He's reminding us, listen, he's reminding us of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He gave his life 
For what purpose? So that we could have fellowship with God. He gave his life so that we could have fellowship with one another as members of Christ's body. Y'all in and say, oh yeah. Does believing on the Lord Jesus Christ separate or unite? It's a rhetorical question. Let, let me, let me, let me, let me, uh, I, I just thought of something in asking that question. Does, does, does believing on the Lord Jesus Christ separate or unite? It separates us from the world. It unites us with other believers. Follow-up question. Does saving faith separate us from other believers or does it unite us together? It unites us together. Again, John says, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. So how can a person say they're in Christ? How can a person say they're living in the light? How can a person say they, they've received God's spirit? How can a person claim to have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and yet refuse to fellowship with other believers? It's a contradiction to the word of God. I'm just reading the text. Verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. What we say and how we live, listen. What we say and how we live, listen. What we say and how we live reveals our faith as to whether or not it's genuine. Show is quite up in him. So John reveals to us in this text that there are certainly those who claim to be Christians, but in reality they do not, have, uh, say, uh, they do not possess saving faith. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Apparently John is writing to people who were claiming to have reached spiritual perfection. Have you ever known anybody like that? I've known a few people. It's rare, but you do run into those that claim that They've been a Christian so long, they've reached perfection. Well, bless God, we ain't going to reach perfection this side of heaven. God's still working on me. I don't know about you. But uh, apparently John is writing to people who claim to live without sin, and yet John refutes this idea. If we say that we have no sin, sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. To say that we have no sin is to be deceived. To say that we have no sin is refusing to accept the truth of God's word. Verse 9, but if we confess. Everybody say if. if. Stress if. Say if. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Forgiveness does not come automatically. If we confess, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us. To confess sin is to agree with God about our sin. To confess sin is to acknowledge to him that there are things that are wrong in our life. And when we confess, when we confess, God forgives. If we confess, he's faithful and just. If we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar and his word is not in us. I love these verses. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My little children. Here again is a purpose statement. John says, I'm writing this letter. My little children. These things I write to you. For what, what purpose? So that you may not sin. A better translation would be, I'm writing this letter to you so that you may not continue to live a life of sin. And if anyone sins, and we all do, we have an advocate. We have someone who represents us before God the Father. Who is he? He's Jesus Christ, the righteous. And I love this. And he himself, Jesus Christ himself, is the propitiation for our sins. In other words, he, Christ, he satisfies the just demands of a righteous God. You deserve hell. Jesus Christ experienced hell, so you don't have to go there. You deserve judgment. Jesus Christ hung on the cross. He took God's judgment upon himself so that you wouldn't have to. You deserve God's wrath. You're a low-down, good-for-nothing worm. You're a sinner, and you deserve to die. 
But Jesus Christ put himself between you and God, and he took your punishment upon himself. He became the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now, his atoning sacrifice does not guarantee that everyone's sin is automatically forgiven. The work he did on the cross only applies to those who believe and trust in him. And those who believe and trust in him, as the text teaches us, those who believe in Christ, y'all listening? It's kind of a summary. Those who genuinely believe and trust in Christ, they fellowship with one another. It's in the text. That is, they live in community. There's a common bond that draws us together, namely our faith in Jesus Christ. Those who genuinely believe in Jesus Christ, we worship together, we sing together, we pray together, we cry together, we learn together, we grow together, we seek God together, we serve his body, the church, together. We're in fellowship with one another. We have fellowship with God. Those who are true believers in Jesus Christ, not only do they have fellowship with other believers, but more importantly, they have fellowship with God. They, they commune with God. There's oneness. There's a relationship that only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And those who truly believe in Jesus Christ for salvation, they live in the light as God is in the light. In other words, their life is characterized by light. It's not characterized by darkness. Anyone claiming to know God whose life is characterized by sin, and unholy living is a liar according to the text according to the text there are those who profess to be Christians but their lack of fellowship with other believers and their lifestyle says something entirely different so what about you this morning what about you are you walking in the light as he is in the light is your life characterized by light is your life characterized by darkness do you have fellowship with God or is there unconfessed sin in your life? John says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. It's only by the blood of Jesus Christ, verse 7, look at it. It's only by the blood of Jesus Christ that we can be cleansed from our sin. And the Bible says we've all sinned. That includes me and it includes you. We've all sinned and we come short of the glory of God. Jesus came and he lived a perfect life and thus he became the perfect sacrifice. He died with our sins upon him and he became the atoning sacrifice, the propitiation for me and for you. And without him in our life, we can't make it. So have you trusted in Christ to save your soul? Are you living your life to honor him? Are you walking in the light as he is in the light? You know, I hear people sometimes they, they doubt their salvation. It's not a bad thing. The Bible says we're to test ourselves, we're to examine ourselves. But John says, I've written this letter so that you may know that you have eternal life. There may be some people here this morning, you're in doubt. We're going to spend the next few weeks studying 1 John. So that we can gain assurance. Other people here this morning, you may be deceived into thinking you're saved when in reality you're not. You had an ex you, you're depending on mama's testimony of what you did when you were seven years old. So that ain't going to get you in heaven. It ain't about your mama's testimony about you. It's about a life lived for Christ. The same person I was talking to this past week, so in, in your opinion... What, what do you understand it, it means to, to be a Christian? I said, well, my opinion is based on years and years and years of study of God's Word. And so my opinion, we've all got one, right? They're like elbows. You got an opinion, I got an opinion. What's your opinion based on? Most people can't tell you what their opinion is based on. It's what they feel and what they think. My opinion, based on the study of God's Word, my opinion based on this. So... We can know. Do you know? I was going somewhere with that and I forgot what I was saying. Where was I going, Lisa? What kind of teleprompter are you? <laughs> Not a mind reader. I don't guess it was important. Uh, so if you don't know this morning, you don't know where you are in your relationship with God, I, I encourage you. Get on your face before God. Read 1 John. Attend this study together. 
Let us all grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to pray, and our praise team is going to come on up. Laura, I'm going to be baptizing her this morning. So as I'm praying, you and Lisa can go on back and get ready, and I'll join you all in a few minutes. Thank God for her baptism. We recognized her last week. She's committed her life to Christ, and this morning she's following the Lord in believer's baptism. So we're going to be baptizing her in just a few minutes. If there's others here this morning um, need to make a profession of faith uh, this morning, uh, we'll go ahead and baptize you this morning. I thought about it during the worship service. I said, I didn't bring any more clothes. <laughs> oh, I'm so forgetful. I'm finding that the older I get, the more forgetful I am. So let's pray. Amen. Son, that got, more, that, that got more amens than the gospel, didn't it? <laughs> let's pray. Father, you've been so good to us, and you have made a provision, Lord, for all of us. You've made a provision, Lord. Uh, so that we can enter into a right relationship with you. Uh, it's through your son, Jesus Christ. God, we've all got a problem. Everybody in this room, we've got a problem. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God, you made a provision whereby our sins could be forgiven and we could enter into a relationship with you. And that provision is your son, Jesus Christ. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And Father, for those who trust him today as Lord and Savior, we pray, God, that you would that you would make us sure of our salvation, God, that you'd help us to flesh it out each and every day of our life, that we would live our lives to honor you and that our talk would match our walk. Father, for those that are deceived, I pray the enemy, the enemy has blinded them in some way. God, I pray uh, that some things were shared today from your word, Lord, that might open our eyes, that might open the eyes of those who are deceived, Lord, that they might come to a, a, a true belief in Jesus Christ, a true commitment to Jesus Christ. We say that we know God and yet we live in darkness. We lie, the Bible says. So Father, if there's anyone that's deceived, God, we pray for their salvation. If there's anyone that's in doubt, Lord, just give them assurance. I pray for this study. I pray that you'll use it in my life and I pray that you'll use it in the lives of those who hear it. Bless us now as we continue with our worship. Stir our hearts. God, as we, as we think about salvation, I pray that you'd make us mindful of those people in our lives, people that we know. Maybe they profess to be Christians, but they're out of fellowship with the church. Lord, we need, we need to pray for them. We need to lift these people up to you. We know people who profess to be Christians, and yet their lifestyle just totally contradicts that. So God, help us to take what we've learned today and share it with others out of love, out of concern, out of compassion. Help us to pray for them before we share it. For guidance and wisdom and discernment. I pray that our response to this message, Lord, would, would please you and it would honor you. Help us to worship you, Father, and be pleased with our worship. I make